America is in a state of revolution. It's not the kind of revolution with competing armies or a coup d'etat. It's an invisible revolution along the axes of race, gender, and identity, and it's shaking our country down to the foundations. I'll show you exactly how we got here and what we can do to push back. In order to understand America's cultural revolution, it's important that we go back to the origin point, the year 1968. This was an era of incredible turmoil in the United States and around the world. And when you go back into that time and you look at the documents, you read the books, you understand the news reporting, uh, you can see very clearly that the Marxist left, left-wing intellectuals in the West were uh, really at a self-described dilemma or impasse. They believed that the revolution in many ways had failed. It failed in the Soviet Union, which after World War II, everyone acknowledged has, had descended into bureaucratic tyranny with uh, gulags and extreme methods of suppression and uh, not even providing basic sustenance for its population. But more importantly, it also had failed in the countries of the West. When they looked to Europe and especially the United States, the Marxist intellectuals sought, thought that uh, the working class, in which Karl Marx had invested all of his hopes as the revolutionary proletariat, uh, had actually uh, transformed culturally and become not just non-revolutionary, but in fact anti-revolutionary. People in the United States that were in the middle and working classes were largely satisfied with the rapidly rising standard of living, uh, with a level of material comfort that had been unknown uh, in all of human history to the common citizen. And so rather than give up on Marxist theory, uh, the intellectuals at the time, predominantly the intellectuals uh, who were known as the critical theorists, uh, developed an alternative strategy to implement their revolutionary ideology. Uh, and so what we have is someone kind of most prominently at the University of California, San Diego, a philosopher named Herbert Marcuse, uh, who had immigrated from Germany uh, after Hitler had taken power uh, and had really been working with his colleagues to develop these new critical theories, sometimes called neo-Marxist theories. And a critical theory, very simply, uh, is a theory in contrast to the traditional theories, which sought to explain the world, which sought to reveal human nature, which sought to uncover these eternal principles. Uh, a critical theory, on the other hand, was a, a, a theory that sought to uh, expose and undermine and demythologize existing social institutions to, to, to then convert or transform them towards the complete liberation uh, of human potential, the com complete liberation of society. Uh, and so these critical theories, and most specifically coming from uh, Herbert Marcuse, became really the dominant philosophy of left-wing ideology and left-wing politics of that era. Students in 1968 were marching through the streets uh, in European capitals, uh, unfurling banners that read uh, Marx, Mao, Marcuse, uh, meaning Karl Marx, the kind of touchstone creator of Marxism as a uh, economic and political theory, uh, Chairman Mao Zedong, who brought uh, kind of Marxist, Leninist revolution uh, to, the, to the country of uh, China in 1949, and then this elderly German intellectual, Herbert Marcuse, who promised to bring the principles of Marxism uh, to the current era. And so he believed, Marcuse believed, that they could create a new proletariat, not based on the working classes, not based on seizing control of factories uh, and other means of economic production, but a two-part proletariat that brought together those uh, kind of white student radicals that fermented the universities around that time, and then the black urban underclass that had been riding against, in many cases, abominable social conditions uh, in American ghettos. And Marcuse believed they could unite these two disparate and in some ways contradictory elements uh, the white intelligentsia, uh, and the black urban population to become a new proletariat that could advance a program of cultural change and cultural subversion that would eventually uh, weaken those structures of society uh, 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 that prevented the true rupture, uh, the true kind of socialist rupture. And uh, Marcuse made this very clear. He wrote about how to enact this cultural revolution, uh, and he wrote that it would assume the character uh, of, quote, preparing the grounds for the coming socialist revolution. Uh, 
And so the goal, always the same, that Marxist socialist revolution, although the methods in the 1968 revolution started to shift, they were starting to find a, a, a way of bringing this about uh, uh, in a non-traditional or non-orthodox way. And so when you bring those principles together, the philosophy of the critical theories, the new two-part proletarian, and the program of cultural revolution, you get this extremely powerful expression that began with the explosive year of 1968 and has traveled now more than a half century to a position where it's gained uh, dominance in elite American institutions, starting in academia and now going into other elements of the American bureaucracy. It's a potentially a world historical change. It started in 1968 and it's now at the forefront of our society. As we trace the development of the critical theories from 1968 to the present, uh, we see that these theories have now spawned their own subdisciplines, which have become dominant in American intellectual life. The best example, perhaps, is critical race theory, which takes that basic Marxian concept of class conflict and transposes it onto the axis of race. The critical race theorists have argued since the late 1980s when their discipline formed that the American uh, society is fundamentally and irredeemably racist, and that all of our American institutions, from the Constitution to the Bill of Rights, to the Civil Rights Act, to freedom of speech, uh, to our culture and economic system, preach the values of liberty and equality. But when you rip away the mask, when you understand what's really happening beneath the surface, their mechanisms of maintaining white supremacy and racial domination uh, this ideology, which began in elite law schools like Harvard Law School in the late 1980s, has now been perpetuated through almost every bureaucracy in our country. Uh, first, according to the critical race theorists themselves, they've published this in interviews and articles and journal publications, the critical race theorists colonized the education system. First and foremost, the uh, uh, teacher training programs in graduate schools of education. They moved to the other disciplines like sociology and anthropology and public health and other places in the universities uh, until finally in the last decade or two decades uh, starting to become solidified in the administration of universities as so-called diversity, equity, and inclusion. From there, it went to the K-12 education system. You see very clearly that the principles of critical race theory, most notably uh, systemic racism, white supremacy, white privilege, uh, whiteness, abolition, uh, have become dominant, especially in left-wing K-12 uh, education systems in places like uh, Portland and Seattle and New York and Chicago, where they've been adapted into specific K-12 pedagogies. Uh, and then you see it really moving even into Fortune 500 companies as part of uh, diversity and inclusion projects, as part of diversity training programs. Uh, to the point where you see Fortune 500 diversity trainings, K through 12 pedagogies, and then kind of pure critical race theory in law schools, trafficking in the same core set of concepts and ideas. And the critical race theorists were very deliberate in this strategy. Why are they doing this? Why do they want to go from university to K through 12 to uh, corporate bureaucracy to federal agency? It's because they explicitly adopted the political strategy of Antonio Gramsci, an Italian communist intellectual uh, who said that in order to gain power uh, for the revolution, one of the most sophisticated strategies is to gain power, cultural power, in knowledge-making institutions. So uh, those institutions that start to transmit knowledge, that start to educate younger people, that start to form the background concepts and language from which we operate in our day-to-day -day lives. And so if you're wondering, as you're going to work, as you're looking in your child's backpack with the lessons that are coming home from school, as you're uh, reading the headlines in the newspaper, where are all these ideas coming from? Why is it that it seems that they've achieved dominance? It's because the critical theorists, specifically the critical race theorists, have adopted that uh, Gramscian war of position using their status, prestige, and power within elite institutions to try to promote these ideas more broadly in American society. And on that case, it's been a stunning success. For the past year and a half, I've reported on critical race theory uh, in the federal government, in 
at least a third of the Fortune 100 companies uh, in K-12 education systems that are educating collectively millions of upon millions of uh, American kids. And it seems like that march through the institutions, which was first proposed in 1968, has achieved a position of dominance, has achieved that stunning success that they outlined in their hope and ambitions uh, starting in 68, continuing to 1987, and now achieving what is very close to hegemony or intellectual dominance within the institutions today. The question then, if the critical theories have gained dominance in American institution, is what do we do about it? I'd propose that the first thing, the most important beginning point, is that we have to accept the Cultural Revolution as a serious political development, and we have to take it seriously on its own terms. And therefore, in conditions of Cultural Revolution, the only proportionate and intelligent response is to mount a counter-revolution. This has been true for the last 150 years, from Karl Marx uh, to the Russian revolutionaries of 1917 to the critical theorists of the 1960s. The greatest fear, that line that runs through all of their thinking, is a fear of the restoration of the regime's values, the fear that the middle will revolt against their elite institutions and reimpose the previous order. And so I'd propose that the ambition of our movement, the ambition for not only conservatives, but people in that broad middle, uh, people who re are represented by the common citizen, uh, is to mount a strategy of counter-revolution that strikes at the heart of the program of the critical theorists. This will require a really three-step program. First, it requires tapping into that deep sentiment that's held by the common citizen, that senses that something is happening with our institutions that is wrong, that when they see that homework coming back and it's critical race theory, or they, or they go to work and they're being shamed for their race or gender, uh, that, that, that somehow this is not just a one-off problem, but it's intelligible as a political phenomenon that can be opposed on substantive and political grounds. Second, we have to develop a language. We have to develop a language that busts through the euphemisms like diversity, equity, and inclusion and gets to the real truth of the matter. For example, that critical race theory is being dominant in our institutions and also develop a language that can arm the common citizen uh, with a method of speaking back, with the method of speaking uh, uh, successfully against this uh, ideology that is being imposed from above. And third, we have to mobilize a democratic coalition to oppose the critical theories where they exist, which is in our public institutions. The conflict today is not the conflict that was predicted by the critical theorists uh, between the intelligentsia and the non-revolutionary uh, working classes or between uh, the racial categories of whiteness and blackness. The conflict today and how we have to conceptualize this fight of counter-revolution is that this is an elite revolution that seeks to use public institutions at the highest level to impose a new set of values against the common citizen against the common people. And so therefore, the political coalition that must emerge is a political coalition of the common citizens in revolt against the elite institutions. And we can leverage our democratic power through school boards, through state assemblies and state senates, and ultimately through the federal uh, deliberative bodies uh, in Congress in order to advance a policy program to strike back against the critical theories. And while it sometimes seems that these theories have de generated absolute control over all of our knowledge-making institutions, that they've become the, the, the common language, the common conceptual reference for all of our political discussions, there is a key vulnerability. There is an Achilles heel. It's that the critical theories since the beginning are a creature of the state. They've been totally subsidized by public institutions and public dollars, and they can only survive within the publicly funded bureaucracies. And so, as a force representing the majority of the American people, finding our power within the democratic institutions of the legislature, we can sever that connection. We can separate the critical ideologies from the bureaucratic power centers.
because the public institutions ultimately must reflect the will of the public, they must reflect the values of the public, and they must serve the public good. And so this counter-revolution can start to identify where the critical theories have power in those bureaucracies that are insulated from the market, that are insulated from citizen oversight, that are insulated from direct control, and then start to change the laws and policies to strip funding from the critical theories, to strip power from the critical theories, and to start reorienting our public institutions uh, towards serving the common citizen. If the counter-revolution is the path forward, the question is, what does it look like? What kind of policies could we adopt that would make a meaningful difference in this conflict? I'd suggest that the key strategy should be the siege of the institutions. Conservatives have to wake up and realize that the establishment is no longer the establishment of 30 or 50 or 60 years ago. But in fact, it's a left-wing bureaucratic establishment that has adopted the critical theories as its default ideology. And rather than attempting to march back through the institutions and take over DEI departments and make them more conservative, we should simply lay siege to them. If they don't serve the public good, if they're not serving the interests of the citizens, they should be defunded, abolished, stripped down, and converted into something that would be more reflective of the public's values and the public principles. This siege of the institutions should start where the critical theories are their most vulnerable, in those three domains where they've achieved the most power that are at the discretion of public policy, the federal government, the K-12 school system, and the universities. First, the federal government. The U.S. federal government is the single largest funder and subsidizer of the critical theories in the country. This happens through direct loans and grant programs to universities, as well as tens of millions of dollars per year through the federal contracting and grant-making programs in places like the NEH, the, NE the NEA, even the NIH, which theoretically supports scientific funding in health, but in many cases it's been documented as funding research that adopts the critical theories. And it doesn't matter who's in office, Democrat or Republican, conservative or liberal, uh, the permanent federal bureaucratic apparatus in D.C., funds the critical theories year after year. And in fact, I reported during the Trump administration that institutions like the National Nuclear Weapons Laboratory, the Department of the Treasury, uh, the FBI, the Veterans Administration, uh, it really every facet of the federal government had been making grants that were based on critical theories, which ostensibly the president would have opposed, but also bringing in diversity trainers, who in many cases had banked millions of dollars in public funding, teaching the principles of critical race theory, and really indoctrinating federal employees into the ideology of critical theory. And so this situation is a choice by legislators and by the presidents uh, that could be reversed with the stroke of a pen. And so the first step is to uh, do a top-down audit of all federal contracting, grant-making, and funding programs, and simply stripping and eliminating funding for anything that uses the core concepts of critical theory, critical race theory, and critical gender theory. You could wipe out the entire ecosystem of diversity consultants and trainers and, and grant-dependent intellectuals uh, simply by identifying it and putting a stop to it. Second, the K-12 through schools. As we've seen now in more than a dozen states, uh, there's a three-part program that needs to happen in order to sever that connection between K-12 education and the critical ideologies. First, legislatures have the power and actually the responsibility to make sure that what's being transmitted in K-12 public schools reflects the values of the voting public. And so more than a dozen legislatures have now banned critical race pedagogy in public schools. You can't uh, practice race essentialism collective guilt, or race-based discrimination uh, in your teaching and pedagogy and materials, which has stopped CRT uh, from being taught to now millions of kids. Second, what we need is complete and total curriculum transparency. Every parent in this country, I believe, has a fundamental right to know what's being taught to their kids in public and government schools. And so now we have legislators in about 20 states that have introduced uh, curriculum transparency bills that would require all public schools to post all of their teaching materials online. 
so that parents could go with a few clicks of the mouse and see exactly the materials that are being used uh, to teach their kids in K-12 public schools. And finally, families have a fundamental right that needs to be honored and secured through legislation to exit the public school system if it's violating their values, if it's failing to educate them in the basics, and if it's trying to really supplant and replace the role of parents as the primary custodian of a child's development and replace it with uh, kind of left-wing bureaucrats and ideologies and teachers uh, uh, taking that dominant role away from families. And so we should have, through state legislation, a fundamental right that parents can take their education dollars, which averages out to about $15,000 per year per child, and take them to a public school, a charter school, private school, religious school, or home school. Anything that will prepare their kids for the world, but most importantly, any place that they believe reflects and affirms their fundamental values. This achieves a few important goals simultaneously. First, it gives parents that fundamental right to make sure that their child's education affirms their values. It would also create competition within the uh, various educational providers, so they would actually have to compete and improve to earn those education dollars. And finally, it would restore a system of cultural pluralism in the United States, so that the public schools in a rural area and an urban area, West Coast place and East Coast place, don't have to all homogenize and look like one another. And finally, the universities, the third part of this program. This is the place where the critical theory is developed, most prominently at the publicly funded University of California, San Diego, where Herbert Marcuse was a tenured, prof tenured professor, and now spreading through all of the elite universities, which are either heavily subsidized by student loans guaranteed by the federal government, or in the case of public universities, directly funded by federal and state governments. And so state legislatures, which have really been asleep at the wheel in places like uh, Texas and Tennessee and Florida uh, uh, and other red states, have an opportunity to institute deep reforms to the public university system. They should do a few things. First off, uh, they have the power of the pen. They have the power of public financing. And so they can decide, do we want to have uh, these departments, these priorities, these programs, uh, uh, these uh, staff initiatives, or do we want to abolish them, defund them, uh, discontinue them, and shift money towards something that would better serve the public? These are hard questions, uh, but legislators cannot simply continue to write blank checks. They have to now re-guide the public university system because the fundamental fact of the matter is this. Public universities were founded as a as a way to uh, guide societies toward knowledge, as a way to prepare uh, the best and the brightest in, in, in the states and in the country uh, towards uh, service to the country. Uh, but this has now been uh, subverted. This has now been changed. The goal or the telos is no longer knowledge. It's social activism or so-called social justice. And it's not designed to uh, treat people equally in a system of merit and excellence. It's actually designed to become a kind of a miniaturized version of society where power and prestige are distributed along lines of race, gender, and identity, not on the basis of a pure excellence and achievement. And so legislators can do a few things. They can fund programs that they support, that the public would, that reflects public values, and defund programs that they don't support and don't reflect public values. They should also consider starting a conservative center in every public university that is independently governed, uh, by a group of uh, uh, like-minded people who believe in this fundamental pursuit of knowledge that should really have a kind of conservative counterbalance to the left-wing departments in other places in the public universities. These conservative centers could hire conservative academics, they could train conservative graduate students, and they could provide that much-needed diversity of opinion and, and real substantive debate within the university community. And if you put together those various elements, making hard choices about funding, uh, making uh, these, renewing these, the, the mission of universities with these conservative centers, uh, and then changing these, uh, these departments of diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, uh, into departments of perhaps equality, merit, and colorblindness to really make all of those principles institutionalized at the administrative level, if you can cobble together all of those reforms to the public university systems, you have a method of reform that would restore the greatness and the principles of our publicly funded universities 
and make sure that they're ultimately serving the common citizen, that they're reflecting the values of the public. And so, taken together, this strategy of the siege of the institutions that plays in the battlefields of the federal government, the K-12 school system, and the public university system would represent a fundamental political change. These are deep problems. They're going to require the mobilization of citizens. They're going to require uh, intelligent and really deep reforms uh, of public policy. And they're going to require going up against entrenched interests whose entire livelihood uh, uh, depends on this feather-bedded bureaucracy that promotes the critical theories that is immune to the public check for the past decades. Uh, but it can be done. It's a program of counter-revolution that could sever that connection uh, in a deep and profound way between ideology and bureaucracy. And historically, the counter-revolution succeeds when it does exactly that. Historically, we've seen over and over and over that when ideology takes absolute control over bureaucratic and administrative power, it wins. In our case, it's not too late, uh, but it will require fundamental action, and that's where it has to go. So where do we go from here? I think what we're seeing right now is the very earliest stages of this counter-revolution. It's something that you can probably feel or see or hear in your daily life. You go to work, you look in your child's backpack, uh, you read the news headlines. You know that something has gone horribly wrong within our elite institutions. You know that some of the things that you're seeing, even in your local experience, uh, violates some of your most deeply held principles and values. And so what I think is encouraging, what I think is inspiring, even though it seems sometimes that the critical theories have taken a hegemonic position within our, within our institutions, even though it seems like wherever you look, there is critical race theory, critical gender theory, making new inroads into the institutions that matter to you in your daily life, there's also a countervailing power that is starting to mobilize. I've seen in the last 18 months after extensive reporting on critical race theory in schools, a, a, a truly uh, inspiring, organic, grassroots parent revolt where you saw over the course of the summer and then the fall, parents showing up at those school board meetings. They're tired, they just got home from work, but they're going to say, we don't want critical race theory in our K through 12 curriculum. We don't want uh, teachers bec t making our children into political activists. We want to restore the values of individual merit. We want to restore equal treatment. And we want to restore going back to the basics of reading, writing, math, and preparing kids for success in the real world. This was a movement that went from district to district until you had more than a thousand districts uh, in open revolt against the bureaucrats and the ideologues who were pushing uh, critical race theory uh, in K through 12. And what I think this shows, what I think this demonstrates, is that there is this latent reservoir, this deep-seated feeling of, 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 of public opposition to the critical theories. And now we have to take it to the next three steps. We have to give it a name. We have to give it a language of dissent. And we have to give it a method where they can rally and mobilize at school districts, at state legislatures, and all the way to the U.S. Congress in order to demand changes to the system, in order to sever that connection between ideology and power that threatens the well-being, that threatens the principles, and really threatens the autonomy and viability of the common citizen. And so we can start to think of this as a revolt of the common citizen against the elite institution. This is a revolt that's happened many times throughout history. It's really a total inversion of the ideas from Orthodox Marxism and even the critical theories of Neo-Marxism. Uh, but it has this uh, tremendous popular power that just needs to be harnessed and trans translated from public sentiment into public policy. And if we can do that, if we can mobilize people, if we can create a comprehensive agenda for the siege of the institutions, and we can restore the beautiful values of 1776 against the destructive uh, values of 1968, this counter-revolution can succeed and we can restore the dignity, the autonomy, and the possibility of the common citizen.